Hello lovely people, I'm K3N and welcome to my channel and welcome to 2024. Happy New Year everybody. Um, this is the first video of 52 weekly videos throughout 2024 um, where I'm going to make a little slow stitch piece and I'm going to put it into my journal that I made in um, the tutorial of the slow stitch journal with the soft covers. I've also got my borrow inspired journal but I'm going to use this for this project and that for something else. So let's get started. Exciting isn't it? It seems like it's taken ages to get here and at the same time it's come in a flash. Anyway, um, so how I'm going to do it and how I said what I said um, a long time ago when I did the introduction to slow stitch video you could do any number of things if you want to make these little weekly pieces. You'll end up with 52 little pieces like, you know, there or thereabouts. You can make them any size you like, actually. Um, you, I always like to put them in a stitch journal, but you could absolutely join them all in a long, thin, long strip and wind them around a scroll, or you could patch them together into some kind of wall hanging or, you know, whatever. Or you could just keep them as individual pieces in a little pouch. Up to you. But I'm going to put them in my journal. So... This, for the first one, I thought long and long and hard. I've been lying awake at night wondering and thinking and having ideas and discounting them and so on and so forth. And um, I wanted each piece to have a story or some kind of theme or something. Um, and I wanted the first one in particular to be something really kind of special and meaningful. So I was thinking of words. I, I you know, I like words, I like to read, I'm a biblio, bibliophile and so forth. Um, and the word that crops up most often and resonates with me in all your lovely comments is the word community. And um, so I wanted to kind of reflect that word. So I thought about the word community and what it means and how we are kind of a unity of, of people with a common interest brought together through the wonders of the internet. Um, but we're all different. We've, we've got this common love of cloth and stitch, hopefully, most of us. <laughs> um, but we, we still all have our own little, little differences. So in order to reflect that, what I thought I would do is some weaving with cloth to uh, represent how we're all woven together. Um, so we're all different pieces of people. Pieces of people, is that a thing? Um, but we all weave together and we make this one community of lovers of cloth and stitching. Does that make sense? I hope so. So anyway, cloth weaving. So to start with, for page one, here's page one. Um, I'm going to I'm going to make the piece separately and then afterwards I'm going to stitch it onto my, my journal. So the first thing I'm going to decide, I'm going to use a foundation cloth, which is this bit of old sheet with the ubiquitous, you've guessed it, Fred Fred hair all over it. Um, I want a little foundation piece onto which I'm going to do my weaving. So I'm just going to decide, do I want a great big piece like that? Or do I want it more small? I think I'm going to have it more small. So I'm going to be careful not to cut my book. And this bit of sheet was, had been turned. It's quite hard there. Um, so there was a seam up the middle. Do you see that it's machine stitched zigzag? And I want to keep that just to kind of reference the memory of the, the sheet. So that's my piece. Put that away. Put my book away for an hour. And here's my little piece. Now when you select your scraps of cloth for weaving, you need to be aware you're going to end up with three layers. So you'll have your base layer plus your two layers of warp and weft. So it needs to be thin cloth. And I've been in my scraps and I've pulled out my usual dingy grungy. <laughs> with a bit of purple and a tiny bit of bright pink in there as well. Um, and I'm going to start by laying down a warp. You know in weaving you have the warp threads that you set up on the loom going one way and then you weave the weft threads through. So we're kind of mimicking that but with pieces of cloth. Um, so I'm just going to pick one out of here. And I've chosen all the long thin bits. You can absolutely cut off you know, larger scraps if you if you want to, but I like to use, if they're that size already, why not? And I'm going quite thin because I want to fit a good few on here to get a really nice, um, you know, mixture of, of cloths. So I think I'm going to start with that one. I like this. I showed it in the What You Will Need video, 
before I put it in the tea when it was all bright colours. I like it now it's all um, muted by the tea. I'm going to cut it. You could absolutely have it overlapping the edge if you want, you know, it's just entirely up to you, just roughly, 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 however you like. So there's one. And I'm going to put a little, one of my tiny teeny pins, just in one end, right at the end. You could also, if you want to, use a little dab of glue stick. I tend not to, because um, if you get really thick with it, it can be not nice to stitch through, and I, I just don't find it necessary. Um, but if you want to do that, go for it. So I'm just going to lay down pieces somewhat intuitively. They can be all different widths, they can be all the same width. You could even, if you wanted to, just do um, strips torn from one kind of cloth going one way and then another kind of cloth going the other way and then you get a kind of checkerboard effect. This is really fray and naughty. And have some of that. I'm trimming them off kind of unevenly just because I like that raggedy look. But again, you do you. If you want them all neat in the same length, that will also be beautiful. And these teeny tiny pins here really come in handy. In fact, what you can even do then is go back and pin, if you've got bigger pins, just pin the two strips with one pin. Precision's not really the name of the game, it's just holding them down so that in a minute we can weave them. I'm going to use this slightly wider piece of eco print, I think. Why not? And I might just leave it hanging off the edge like that. Again, why not? I hope you can see what I'm doing. Can you see? Yeah, I think you can see. It's a bit of indigo. A bit of indigo never goes amiss. I'm just being quite random. I'm really just almost pulling them out as they jump into my hands. If you want to be more planny, be more planny. I'm kicking that thing. I've put it back under there, I'm sorry. My easel, I referred to it a while ago. My easel for when I'm painting. I'm lining them up with the edge of the sheet just so they're roughly in a straight line. I think I'm going to, quite, I'm quite liking this. Is it in the shot? Do I need to come slightly higher? Up. Quite liking this hanging off the bottom because I'm imagining how that's going to look against the page. So I think I'm going to carry on cutting them higgledy piggledy. And I'm butting them up somewhat, you know, edge to edge. But again, I'm not really, like this strip gets narrower here so you can see white sheet. That doesn't matter because we'll be weaving the other way in a bit and that will all get hidden. Bit of this with the little roses on. Put a pin in it. I'm just pinning the very end of the pin there and letting the, the body of the pin sit over the previous bits. Just planning ahead so I can pin here. If that makes sense. Shall we go? Where should we go with that one? You can always trim them off afterwards. You can always sew another bit on afterwards. So, um, Do I want this wide bit for the finish? I think I do. I think I do. I think I quite like that. Let's go somewhere up there with that. <clears throat> Stop kicking that. Get my, get my feet, tuck my feet under so I don't kick. You don't hear the rattling all the time. And I'm pinning as close up to that edge as I can. Right, so that's my, my warp. And now to do the ones going the other way, the easiest thing to do is to just flip back every other strip. So I'll flip that one back, leave that one laying, flip that one back, leave that one laying, that one back, that one laying, that one back like that. Do you see? Do you see? Do you see? Because I had an odd number, it makes it symmetrical. If that's important to you, you know, if you had an even number, then there'd be, it wouldn't be symmetrical. Some, that bothers some people, that's why I mention it. So if you want to be symmetrical, you need to have an odd number. And then I'm going to get another bit. And then you're going to lay it, and you want to push it up somewhat straight, like that against the, you know, where you flipped it back. Obviously the pins are there, so you can't really go any further. You can scale this up and do much bigger strips and make really large cloths with it. And I've done it on lap quilts and wall hangings and 
and so on, you know, with strips two or three inches wide. If you've got really thin cloth as well, it's a nice way to give it body because you put two layers together. There we go, so that's the first line and I've put all the strips back down. If you wanted that strip now to go right up to the edge, you could take your pins out, squidge it up a bit and put your pins back in, but I'm leaving it like that. So then you just take the alternate strips to the ones you flipped before. And you need to be a bit careful because it's a bit small and fiddly. And you flip those up. And then you choose another little strip of cloth. It's about this bright orange. Mm, not really loving that. Not really loving that. You can of course use the same cloth going the other way. I guess, for example, if I put that one in there, I'll leave that hanging off the edge for now. We can always trim it later. And just, you know, to see what kind of look you get. You see there it's crossing itself. Just play. It's just playing. It's just playing. And you can view this, if you haven't done this before, in your Slow Stitch Journal, as a thing in itself. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, or you can also view it, and I do that sometimes if I'm playing with new new things that I haven't tried before, um, as a, an, a way to experiment. So again, alternate strips back up. You know, a way to experiment with different techniques on a very small scale, and then you may think, oh, I like doing that, I like the look of that, I want to do that on a large scale, and then your little stitch journal or scroll or whatever becomes a, a sort of reference or a reference guide to yourself. See, that's gone diagonal. That's been cut diagonally at the end, but I don't mind. It's mostly going to be under that strip. And if there's a little line there going that way, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me at all. It doesn't bother me. So I hope everybody had a lovely Christmas if you celebrated Christmas or a holiday season in some way. Um, when you see this, it will actually be the 1st of January, but I am filming it because the first Monday in this January is the 1st. <laughs> I'm actually, it's the 31st, so I'm here last year doing this, so that you've got it on the 1st. Because I know those, our friends down under, um, are ahead of us. So probably even now I'm sitting here, they're already in um, next year. A bit of my daddy's shirt, we'll have some of that. And um, that was another aspect to the community and the weaving and the differences and similarities between us all as well was I always um, try to remind myself that just because here it's winter, um, down under it's um, summer. It's that kind of, you know, balance of difference and the same and I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? I was chatting with a lady back and forth on Instagram, who I do believe watches here. In fact, I know she does. I was talking about her glut of um, courgettes, if you're English or French, and um, zucchini, if you're American, or I think Australians also call them zucchinis. I have the same problem in our summer. You cannot give them away for love nor money. Everybody's got too many of them. And she's she's been in Australia, I think. Um, Australia it was. is. Um, in that situation now of having the glut of zucchinis. And it's, it's I don't know, I just, I love it that, that here it's winter and there it's summer, and then when it's our summer, it'll be their winter, or my summer. It's nice to, nice to know that things are different, but the same. I think that's what I'm saying, on a different rhythm but in some ways the same rhythm. I feel like I'm really wittering now, you know, really and truly, but you've all only got yourselves to blame, <laughs> saying that you like listening to me witter. But do you see how this surface of the cloth is building up nicely? Um, that little rose happens to be exposed. It could just have easily have ended up under the strip, hidden its light under a bushel, but it's not. It's shining out there for everybody to see. So you just keep working down until you get to the other side. As you get to the other side and the little strips get shorter, do you see that one doesn't want to stay? Sometimes you have to weight them down with something. Um, let's have some of this dark blue. 
That is quite long. I'm going to cut that down a bit with my scissors, which I'm doubling up as a weight. Whoops, no, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to throw that in there and put that back there. There we go. And then probably I can squeeze one more strip in there. And the other thing you can do if when you're getting towards the end, or if you're working on a much larger piece, is get something like um, a ruler. You know, which I don't have one here. Of course I don't, they're all over there. Let me just grab it, excuse me. A ruler, and if you're working on a big piece and you've got those big quilters rulers that are six inches by 24, or the metric equivalent, if you're working on a big piece, those are handy as well to keep everything everything straight and out of the way. And here, like I said, I'm just lining it up somewhat with it, with the edge of the piece. But if you're on a bigger piece, you could um, use something longer, you know, if it's important to you that it all stays in a straight line. Those are behaving themselves quite nicely, but you can see that you could then do that. Like that. And I want one more little narrow strip to go in there. You shouting, pick me, pick me. This little pink bit. A very fraying it's Osnaburg cotton, which is a very open weave. If you pull at it too much, you end up with nothing. So I'll call that done. That's just about right. There we go. Now, obviously, it's very fragile. If I pick it up now, it will fall everywhere. I'm going to stick a few more pins in it, and I should have taken this up. I will not learn, will I? This is cloth, and underneath is my cutting board. If I now pin through it, I won't be able to lift it up to stitch it. Excuse me, making weird angles with my body so that I can get my pins in. And on a small piece like this, you can maybe get away with just pinning Actually, I'm going to pin through that last strip and, um, and I'm going through all three layers, that last crossway strip. On a small piece, sorry, I started saying something and then started saying something else. I'm g you could um, just get away with pinning the top and the bottom. Um, on a bigger piece, if I was going to pick it up then and put it on my lap to stitch, I probably would pin the ends of these strips as well, so I'd put pins all around. And as you stitch, you will find that you might have to tension them a little bit, you know, if you're doing a, a big piece. Um, I'm now going to carefully turn that and pin that going that way. But I'm hopeful that this little piece will behave itself. There we go. I'm going to hold it up to show you. I'm going to actually cut that bit too much of that, and a bit too much of that. So that's it now. Can you see that? So what I will do now is I'm going to put a line of the invisible base stitch, which I use a lot, and I should every time I use it credit Jude Hill. I don't think she invented it, but she certainly has, as far as I can make out, I haven't seen it used widely anywhere else by anyone who's not a student of hers. Um, she certainly has popularised it for doing this kind of thing. Um, so Jude Hill, do look her up if you don't know her. Let's find the needle, the favoured needle. That one? That one. Oh no, it's not, it's that one. I should have had it ready in advance, I do apologise. No, no, I'll use that one. This is a video of Catherine choosing a needle. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to use this neutral cream vintage machine cotton. Oops, I'm going to get that noisy metal ruler out of the way now. And um, you could absolutely just go straight away and, and do your decorative stitching, but I always like to get the pins out first. Um, I am going to try and keep these with weekly videos within the bounds of reason. <laughs> um, in terms of time. 
but we'll see. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Right, so I'm just going to stitch. Um, you can either go down every line this way or you can go down every line this way. It doesn't really make any difference. I think I'm going to go crossways just because it happens to be that way. If you had wider strips and you're doing a bigger piece, you might need to put more than one line down the middle. You might want to do one line down the middle and, um, you know, line of stitching and one line down each edge or whatever. I would say maybe they need the lines need to be no more than sort of an inch and a half apart. So the invisible baste, if you haven't seen it yet, you take a teeny tiny back stitch on the front surface of about two or three threads of the cloth, and then a big stitch on the back of an inch or so. And this stitch stays in. You don't get it out afterwards. And just go along and make sure that you catch every strip in place with at least one stitch and that will be enough to hold it and you can get the pins out and then you can st whoop do do don't do that don't do that don't get it trapped all around and ruckle it all up then you can get the pins out and pick it up in your hand and do your decorative stitching without being bitten by the pins and when I get to the end of this I can get that first line of pins out already There we go, get them out, they've done their work, back in the pin cushion, and I'm going to turn it round and go back the other way. Oops. So I'm just going to jump across to the middle of the next strip, and once you've got your first stitch in this side of this cross strip, and coming up like that. You can then go to the other end if you see it ruckling, ruckle, and just gently, because now it's anchored here, gently, you know, don't yank it or, or um, don't yank it too hard or it'll, um, oh, come on, Catherine, what's the word? It'll, it'll crumple, it'll crumple up unpleasantly and that bit of silk wants to poke out, go back in. But just, you know, do you see what I'm doing? Can you see? Just pulling. Just holding it there and pulling gently just so it lays flat. Unless you want it rumply, ruckly, wrinkly, whatever that word is. With these dangly bits. These dangly bits can be an issue. I'll hold it up so you can hopefully see. So I'm just doing the tiny back stitch and a big jump on the front, on the back, sorry. Tiny back stitch on the front and a big jump on the back. The only purpose is to anchor everything down. And like as with when you're doing the collage technique, you know, which we did for the Borrow Journal, we, the royal we, which, which I did and some of you did for the Borrow Journal and the cloth pouch, if you made that one too. Um, what I say there is don't worry if there are little gaps. The same thing applies here if little gaps open up. That's what applique is for or, you know, basically just sew something else over the top. And um, so now I'm going to jump across here. And I'm going to, I've got a bit of loose, a bit of an end there. So I'm going to pull that under a bit more because it's slidey. Silk is lovely, but it's not the easiest thing to work with. There we go. I'm just going to really worry about the one I'm stitching and not worry about the rest until I get to them. Now I've got him anchored. He can't go anywhere anymore. Yeah, I was telling a story in the comments to someone about um, applique. And um, she said that she thought that everybody might think it was amusing, so I'll tell it here. Um, a friend of mine years ago made a quilt, you know, a traditional uh, patchwork quilt uh, by machine, I think. Not that that's really relevant. And while she was making it, she accidentally cut a hole in the, the surface of one of the patches. So in order to hide that, she appliqued, I think it was a heart or a butterfly, or something like that over it to hide the hole, you know. All been there, all done that, I'm sure. And her little granddaughter happened to be staying with her at the time and she was very taken with this butterfly or heart, whichever it was. 
And my friend explained to her granddaughter that she'd made a mistake and she'd appliqued that on there to, to hide the hole. So anyway, fast forward some period of time and my friend made a, a quilt entirely with applique and her granddaughter came to stay and looked at this beautiful applique quilt. I think it was like a Baltimore album quilt, something like that. And she said, she looked at it and she said to my friend, oh granny, you must have made lots of mistakes on that one. <laughs> I thought it was funny. Children, love them. So yeah, applique, not just for hiding your mistakes. We probably will do some applique at one point in one of the weeks of some kind. I like to try and do things a little bit different to the norm. Um, I was, oh, I've unthreaded my needle. I was talking about log cabins and I will do log cabins, and um, but I don't do them normally. <laughs> I'd surprise you to hear. Um, I do them a bit differently. So what I really like to do is, is look at traditional things, whether it's from um, patchwork and quilting or you know other other cultures, and try and try and do them a little bit differently. Stay in. You're at least getting to the end of their naughty bit of thread. So don't groan if I say I'm going to do log cabins, if you're a seasoned quilter and, and go, oh, I know how to do log cabins, I've made about a million of them. Because maybe, 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 baby, I'll do them slightly differently. Or maybe you'll like it and maybe you won't, but it doesn't matter. Just about got enough there. To, I haven't got enough to finish it properly, but I'm just pulling it through to the back because it's only basting. Right, I need a bit more, I need a bit more. And then I'll show you up close. Go on silent. Um, a little Fred, Fred and Stella story for you all. <laughs> if you don't know who they are, Fred, Fred's my cat and Stella is my small naughty dog. I have a big well-behaved dog and a small naughty dog. Sorry, I'm kicking that again. Um, Stella's a small naughty dog, although she's very peacefully and well-behavedly sleeping behind me at the moment. Um, Stella and um, my big dog Sirius, he's called Sirius the Dog Star, sleep downstairs in the kitchen un under the stairs. The stairs are in the kitchen. And there's a little nook under the stairs and they each have a big cushion to sleep on you know those big dog cushions and Cirrus has a fleecy what do you call it a lamb a lamb skin a sheep skin sheep skin um, rug on his Stella did have one but she chewed it up so now she has various old cardigans or towels or whatever but anyway my old boy, who's 12, which is no great age, but because he's a pure breed and he's a big, a big boy, has got arthritis. I mean, for his breed, he's a great age at 12. Um, so at night, he likes to stretch out and he encroaches onto Stella's little corner cushion. <laughs> and then in the middle of the night, she starts, um, she doesn't dare really have a go at him because he's so much bigger than she is. But she kind of makes up to him, you know, she kind of licks around his chops and, and whines and rolls on her back and does all that. And that irritates him no end because it's the middle of the night and he just wants to stretch out his poor old tired aching bones and sleep. So then he starts doing this bark, which is like, Ruff, and then a pause and then Ruff, on and on like that. Anyway, so I thought to myself, I'm sure my mum has got my mum had a dog until a few years ago and he passed away. I'm sure my mum has got one of those um, plastic dog beds. You know those plastic dog beds? With the sides and the little short place for them to get in and out. And her dog was only little and I think I thought if she's still got it that would be just the right size for Stella. So I was over there yesterday and I asked my mum and she said yeah of course there it is, take it. So I brought it home for Stella, thinking now she can sleep in her bed at the side of the understairs nook 
and Sirius can have the whole of the understairs nook all to himself and stretch out and there won't be any yapping in the night. So this morning I wake up in my bed and I hear to the sound of Sirius doing his barking. <laughs> so I go downstairs and what do I find? Some of you, I think, are probably guessing. Um, Sirius is stretched out under his nook. Stella is trying to squeeze herself into a corner of what is now his bed. Her basket, her new basket from my mum, is um, at the side there, with Fred Fred stretched out in it fast asleep. <laughs> um, yeah, so that didn't really work. The trouble is with Fred Fred is if you buy him his own bed, if you make him or get him his own bed, he won't use it. He wants to use somebody else's bed. Of course he does. So that didn't really work. Poor Stells. It's like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Who's been sleeping in my bed? And actually it only happens when my other half, my husband, is away on business. <laughs> because he doesn't like the, well, the dog's certainly not in the bedroom, but he doesn't like the cat in the bedroom. And when he's home, he makes sure that they're all out and he shuts the door on them so they can't get back in. But when he's away, I, to be frank, I do like them in there. I like the company and the extra warmth, apart from my one foot sticking out of the covers. Um, so when he's away, it's not a problem because Sirius is downstairs all alone. And all that wittering on about Fred Fred and the dog bed has got me to the last strip. Oh, I've got a knot. And I can get my last pins out. Oh, it's raining again. We had about two or three days of, well, a day of actually seeing some blue sky. And then we had a couple of days of grey, but at least not raining. And then in the night there was this fantastic wind whipping up, although not as windy as um, one lady I chat with back and forth here in the comments who lives up on in the Orkney Islands of Scotland, where they have quite serious wind. Oh, that sounded wrong, sorry. <laughs> oh no, that's my mind. Um, yeah, you know. The, the the meteorological phenomenon that blows. No, I'm not even going to continue that train of thought about wind. I'm not even sure in America they call that. Anyway, stop talking about wind. <laughs> oh dear. Get on with the stitching. Okay. And then when I finish my basting, I'm going to bring it up close to you and show you how it looks and how it feels. If I can show you how it feels, that's not an easy thing to do. But I'll try. One more pin. That one's... Whoops, come out. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Now I've pulled that out because I got hold of that. Was that naughty bit that was fraying when I put it there? Do you remember? Do you remember? Go back in. I'm just poking back in. Poke that back in. Oops, poke that back in. We want it, you know, somewhat neat. Somewhat neat. There we go. That'll do. That'll do, pig. Okay. And through again. To the back. So the invisible base, if you haven't seen it yet, then you see on the back there all the bigger they're all different sizes. I just made sure that I was into the each once into each strip at least. So here it is, a little woven scrap. And if it, how it feels, it's quite it's got some structure because it's a double layer, but it's quite bendy and soft. So I'm just going to do some running stitch, and I'm going to play with the tension as I like to do, and pull it up somewhat tightly. Oops, not that tightly. And the reason, my reason for this is, well, it, it, uh, twofold. One is I like to do running stitch. 
into these little back cloths when you get a textured surface of cloth that you've assembled somehow. I call it a back cloth. Um, and it's very nice to stitch into. And it's very mindful as well because you've got, this is the same with the collage, because you've got all these different cloths in one little area, you can notice how the stitch reacts to the different cloths and how the different cloths, and also the combination of cloths, receive the stitch. I'm going to do, um, I think I'm going to do my little overcast sticks type stitchy thing along that edge just to be different. And it's really not planning ahead, it's just seeing where you, where the stitching takes you. I don't know where you, are. you must come from there. I don't dare pull you in case you, I pull more than I bargain for. Now you see here I've got a little gap where that's gone to one side. I'm going to celebrate that gap by making a cross over it. Instead of saying, oh, there's a gap. Oh no, I made a mistake. I must hide it. I'm going to kind of emphasize it with a cross. Mar X marks the spot. I'm going to cut that bit of purple off because it's annoying. do next. Go back to just doing straight stitching I think. And there I did a bigger stitch and there's another little square gap because it's shifted and um, actually no it's not because it's shifted it's because this little strip underneath tapered. So I'm going to do another cross. But, so basically you can do anything you want. I usually do quite primitive rustic style stitching because that's what I like to do. If you want to do more standard embroidery type stitching, you know fancy embroidery stitching, then you can do that. If you want to do less stitching or more stitching, if you want to sew lace onto here or beads or sequins or you know whatever. Basically the weaving is just making a surface onto which you can stitch and you can vary your stitching at any point but it's just really being engaged with the piece of the with the little back cloth being engaged with it and um, listening to it tell you what it wants you to do I think that is a nice way of putting it if it makes sense to you And these won't all be this, um, well you could have stopped there after the baste or you could have just done without, not done the basting and just done one line of stitching through and called it done. You could have made a bigger piece, you could have made a smaller piece, you know, you could just make three going one way, you could have just done a tiny piece like that. Absolutely up to you, there's no right or wrong. Um, or you can spend many hours now with it stitching if that's what you want to do. And I would vary from, from day to day. Some days I might, if I'm doing a, sometimes I've done a daily stitch journal and I've usually done those for a period of time such as a hundred days, I have done a year. Um, I did, I made a stitch journal between when we sold our house in England and when we bought this house here in France. Um, and when, that, when I began that, that process I had no idea how long it was going to take we hadn't even found this house um, when we left England. Um, and those daily journals, some, some days I had time, you know, some days were a home day and the husband was working and the children were at school at that point and so and I didn't have, you know, much else to be doing because we were in a rented, um, a little rented cottage. Uh, so I could spend a lot of time and then other times of like now in spring if I'm gardening or whatever you know and it's in, in my spring it is, it's a busy time of year um, see I've gone stick stitching again there because I liked that little edge um, I might not have as much time and if I was in the middle then of a, a journal a daily a daily journal I might just do something that literally takes five minutes but at least I've stitched do you, do you know what I mean? So you kind of, it's like that expression, you cut your cloth accordingly. 
but I like to do them, this I'm doing weekly, because I think daily with you all would be too much. So I thought this is the first time I've done this on, you know, in, in a community, to go back to the theme of our little weekly piece. Um, I thought weekly was uh, a better option to start with. I might use this pink because it's tones with the pink. Um, this is embroidery floss, but it was this, the hank was falling to bits, so I took it off, you know, collapsing. So I took it off and wound it on a spool. I will just repeat this again. You've got six strands. I like to use two. That's just me. If you want to use one because you like the thinner look or more strands because you like the thicker look. But I wouldn't try and pull two strands off at once. I, I have tried and invariably it tangles. So I'm just holding this, the rest of it, kind of between my thumb and forefinger and pulling off one strand. And if you find, if it starts, you feel resistant, stop pulling, go to the other end and just kind of not going to behave itself now. <laughs> kind of slide it along like that. There we go. To pull out some of that extra. And then go back and pull again. If you feel resistant, stop. Don't fight it. It will win. And you'll end up with a tangle and you'll have to cut it. So there I've got one strand off. Um, and now I'm going to pull off a second strand, which usually comes off more easily. Because pulling off the first strand has loosened everything up. This doesn't help either that it's been in T and that tends to stick the, the strands together and then put them back together. And find your needle which you've stuck in your little biscornu pincushion. I'm so pleased with how many of you have um, been making the things I've been sharing and I've been seeing them on Instagram and Facebook and some of you have sent me messages with pictures of them. If I miss your messages, or if I miss your comments, please don't think I'm ignoring you. Um, it's taken me a little while to get to grips with YouTube and how it, it tells me about your comments, because it tells me in many different ways, in many different places, um, in my notifications on YouTube, in the, the app that I use for you know editing and uploading and so on. And obviously I can go to the video and look under the video itself but sometimes it, it doesn't, I don't get a notification for a message and I only see it because I go and look at another message that I've had a notification for, if that makes sense. But anyway, please keep commenting. And if I miss your comment, if I don't answer, I'm absolutely not ignoring you. I really, I don't want anybody to think that. It's just that I probably haven't seen it. And I do go and look, usually a couple of times a day. I've got a knot now. Ooh. Oh no, and it's a serious one. I go and look a couple of times a day. Um, that's really, really a knot. Well, it's a loop that's... There we go. Um, there we go, there we go. In the notifications and under the most recent videos, I sometimes go and look there as well, in case I'm missing things. Uh, but particularly if you've asked me a question and I don't answer you, please don't think I'm ignoring you. Just just shout at me. Just try try asking it again. Um, or, I don't know, asking it somewhere else. Or I don't think you can message people on YouTube. I think you can only publicly comment. Um, and the same on Instagram. I only discovered this morning on Instagram a whole load of messages, some a month old, in a, in a place where they call hidden hidden message requests or something like that. Why, why would they hide them from me? I just saw a tiny little number somewhere saying hidden messages. I, I never even knew that was there. So many apologies if I've missed your comment or your message. It's not, absolutely not me deliberately ignoring you. If you really wanted to spend a lot of time with your piece, you can do running stitches this way and then the other way. And that's really nice to do. I do that quite often. Because what you're doing then is you're mimicking the warp and weft of the cloth strips, you know, so that the cloth itself, if it's woven cloth, which this all is, has a warp and weft in it. It's made of threads woven warp and weftly. 
and then I've woven the cloth strips warp and weftly. I don't think that's a word, but you know what I mean. And then if you stitch one way and then the other, you're, you're mimicking that same movement again of warping and wefting. And that really builds up in the piece, I think. A nice little story of weaving, weaving, weaving. And that was really why I chose this to go with my word of community. That we're all woven together. <clears throat> okay, I did pause the video because it was already getting on for an hour long. Um, but all I did when you weren't watching was carry on doing the straight lines up and down, up and down. And here and there I did some little stick stitches or overcast stitches. If I came across an edge that seemed to demand it, um, and then the final thing I did sh in the beginning where I put the two X's, I put, happened to put a, an X or a cross stitch here where there was a gap and here. And then when I got up to here, I realized I had the makings of four corners. I did two corners. So I did another one there and another one there. So I've got an X. So X marks the spot in each of the four corners of the earth, I thought, which is where we all are, in the four corners of the earth. So that was like, you know, the cloth was telling me a little story as I went along. If that makes any sense to anybody. I think it does. I think I'm beginning to realise that I have found, I have found some people who, who understand what I'm on about. So I'm just doing this last little line up here. In fact, now I'm here, I see that. Do you see that edge there that's kind of hanging? I think I'm going to just nip up there now. Just nip over there and do some little overcast stitches on that edge as well. It's just looking at, looking at what you've done, seeing how it looks and wondering and asking yourself if it needs something new, something else. And it's done, it's done when, when it says it's done. That's better. That's more betterer, as one of my children used to say. I'm going to be very naughty and just jump right back over there where I was. And you see I've got this big, but I don't mind. I don't mind. And um, put these last few stitches. See there I'm noticing where this cloth is overlapping the same cloth with its high thread count. It's really, really thick. So just come through to the back. And that's me done with my running stitch. <clears throat> okay, so there's my little piece. Hold it up close, get my fingers out of the way. Um, and I think that's its way up because I like these fringy bits. If you want, if you know, if you want to make it all square, then you go for that. Uh, and now I'm going to, I'm not going to put it in the book yet. Oh dear, I'm a big clunky, big clunky thing on the end there. I'm just going to have a look at it, how it will look. Now you see those maybe should be trimmed off. That's, the length is fine. I don't know. Am I worried about that? Because they're going to get, every time I close, they're going to get crumpled. I don't know. I'm going to leave them for now. And I just want to do one more bit of stitching on here before I put it into the book. The sun's coming out. Is it making weird shadows? I think it's okay for now. I want to do a circle to represent the circle of community and the circle of the earth and so on. The other thing when you when you do cloth weaving, this is why they get so long because I find other things to say instead of just getting on with it. If you look within the weave, do you see here, if you're a quilter, okay, I haven't got enough hands, do you see there's like a little nine patch when I do that. Do you see that? So you can emphasize that by stitching round. Do you see? A nine patch is three by three. So if you were making a bigger piece, a lap quilt or something using cloth weaving, you could then do some stitching round and round the edge there or, or sew something, some braid or something on and you'd, you'd have little nine patches. It's just, it's just fun to play with. Anyway, back to the circle. I'm trying to choose what size I want. 
want it that big. Maybe I do want it that big. I don't know if it's slightly too big. Maybe that one's just slightly smaller. So I'm just going to center it somewhat by eye. And get my teeny tiny pins. You could also, of course, draw a circle on with a, one of those pens that you can get rid of. There's the blue ones that come off with water, or there's the um, heat pens that come off with an iron. But I do this low tech. And you can see that I've used these circles over and over and over again. And at one point they, they tear and you have to make a new one. But all I did, I'm sure you can work it out for yourselves, is draw around something circular on a bit of paper. This was a bit of tracing paper. Just some kind of thinnish paper. These were the backs of envelopes. And then you pin it on. And this was why I was thinking that I'd use this slightly darker colour so that it would show up. Okay, so I've got my two strands of floss. And all I'm simply going to do is stitch once around the edge of this circle. And then I'm going to take the template off and decide maybe if I want to stitch again. So I'm doing quite small stitches because I'm going around the curve and I'm getting my little flappy bits trapped together. And I leave the pins in the template until I've stitched the whole thing. Can you see? I'm getting up as close as I can to try and optimise me seeing and you seeing. I'm doing quite small stitches so that it makes a nice curve. Right, that's my last stitch. I'm going to leave it attached just in case I decide to go round again. I'm going to get out the pins, the pins, the little pins, little clover applique pins. And then I'm going to take a view if I think that is. I think I might go around again just so you can really see it because it's so the background's quite busy for all the tits blendy blendy. My my colour palette is quite muted. So all I'm going to do is come back up um, inside, I think. You could go inside or outside, just you know. If you go inside you make the circle slightly smaller, if you go outside you make it slightly bigger. And I'm just going to follow that stitching line. The same thing applies to straight lines. I've had a few questions about keeping lines straight when you're doing all this parallel stitching. I just kind of line up to the edge of... With cloth weaving it's easier because you've got all these straight lines everywhere to follow. But if it was a collage piece, you would, I would line it up to the edges of patches, you know, as I came to them, just by eye. Um, that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is it probably is one of those things that does improve with practice the more you do it. Okay, so I'm round. Uh, when I come to the end, because I want to be somewhat even in my spacing, I just kind of think, well, if I do a stitch there and a space, and then I can fit another stitch, and then there's still room for a space. So there I just can vary slightly the the width of my stitch and my gap so that it looks somewhat do you know what I mean? So you don't end up right on top of that stitch or with a huge gap. Like that. Good. That's done. I think that's two lines is enough. So, here he is. And he feels he. I don't know why he's a boy. It. it. <laughs> it's an animate object. It feels lovely and soft and it's got real, real structure to it but at the same time you know you can crumple it up and if you make one yourself make sure to give it a good feel before you stick it down into your book or however you're going to put it into your book. Which brings me to putting it into my book. Um, so I think you, you could stick it, you could just put some glue and stick it you know or some double sided tape would also work. But I think, and also because it's quite big and I do want to write. I uh, might have room to write there, but it's a bit... I'm going to stitch it, and I think I'm just going to stitch it to the paper along the top. Because I do like to be able to look at the backs of things. You could stitch it all the way around if you prefer it to, you know, sit still in its place and not flip about. You could stitch it here and have it 
opening like that. You could stitch it there and have it opening like that. Oh, you know, there are options. But I am going to stitch it, or I'm going to use this, which is what I used to baste. Fine cotton and a fine needle. Um, paper, I have tried this paper before I made the book. I think I did say that, I hope I did, when I was making the book. But it, most paper will tolerate being stitched through. Um, the best kinds are cardi paper and locked paper for stitching. But anyway, this is just sketchbook paper that's been tea dyed. So, but obviously I can't pin. Well, I could pin, but then you make holes. Every hole you make in paper will stay. So you could get one of your, how I don't to do that. Handy dandy, excuse me, I've disappeared. I hope you can still hear me. Doo doo. Giant paper clips. <coughs> or, you know, one of these clippy dips, clippy doo dars, or those um, fabric people use them instead of pins to clip fabric together. But I am going to use a giant paper clip. Just make sure I've only got one page. I don't want to sew two pages together. That would be a disaster. I'm going to put it slightly higher to the top. I'm just going to make sure I don't get it underneath my cloth. There we go, that'll do. Get my needle back. Um, and when you stitch to some papers, you have to go in and back, in and back. Um, if it's thick paper, some cardi paper, often you have to do that. I'm doing a double knot because it's quite fine. I'm going to anchor my thread first in my back of my piece. And I'm going to, again, make sure I've only got one layer. Come back up to the front. And I'm going to try and go in and out in one movement. Can you see, have I done, I've done the naughty thing. So I'm going to go in through the paper and back up. And just pull it carefully. If you have a look on the back, can you see? It's just a tiny little stitch. And I'm not putting anything on this side. I've allowed enough pages that I can do 52 pieces on the facing page. So this side will either be blank or it may, might get written on or something at one point. And I actually do quite like the stitching showing through on the other side. I can't see if it's straight because I'm not directly above it. You are, and you can't tell me. There we go. Is it okay? Can you see what I'm doing? It's straight, I think. So basically, I'm just I'm going sort of straight through, and then turning the needle and coming straight back. And only if it's really thick paper will it not let you do that. If it's really thick paper and you have to do stab stitching, then you go through to the back and pull it through. And then if it bothers you that your stitches on the back are in a straight line, you look at the back to make sure you're coming through. Do you see what I mean? You know, go, go, go and look at the back as you come back through. But I'm happier doing this as long as I can get away with it. And the paper's quite sturdy. I find that tea dyeing, coffee dyeing, whatever, sturdies paper up a bit as well. I will, I keep promising, I know, I will do a video about tea dyeing and coffee dyeing and so on. Once the madness of Christmas and New Year's is over and I'm here all alone and I can take over the whole house because I would do that downstairs. When everybody's gone back to work and university. So my stitches are not very neat, but to my mind they're just there to do a job. And it's a little bit awkward as you get close to the spine of the book, but it's doable. One more, I think. There we go. Right. I brought it towards me again. I'm just going to go into the bit of sheet at the side there and anchor it. I'm going to do it on the front. 
go through the loop, go through the loop again and pull it up. And then just bury my tail somewhere under that little strip. That's it. Snip. <clears throat> Take out my giant paper clip. Make myself some room. And there is page page one. Get my giant paper clip off carefully. There he is. There is page one. And all I have to do now, and he flips up, and I do like that because then you've got another place there if you wanted to do a lot of journaling. You've got, you know, nearly the whole page that you can still write on or sketch or whatever. Um, I am literally just going to, probably for the whole year, each week, just pick a word. And this word, I'm going to put it somewhat in the middle, was community. And I like to use pencils rather than pens. I'm trying to write it. I can't actually see what I'm doing. Come you, you, I don't want to spell it wrong. <laughs> T. I can't actually see. Does that say community? Yes, I think that's correct. There. And then I'm going to put the date. Where shall I put the date? Top right corner. I'm going to cheat because I'm going to put tomorrow's date for me, but it's the day that it will be, you know, that you'll be watching. So that is 01, 01, 24. And then I'm going to sign it. K3N and a little kiss, which is how I sign my, you know, pieces I exhibit and sell and so on. And that's me done. Can you see? Can you see? So it's my little woven thing, four corners of the world, the circle of community, the woven nature of our relationships, me with all of you, and community. Page one, week one. I hope that was nice and pleasant and lovely. And I look forward to seeing you next Monday for week two and for more cloth tales. Thank you so much for watching. Have a lovely week. Goodbye.